uh, and I uh, and I yeah I wanted to say yeah thanks a lot for the opportunity uh, for me to come talk to you about some of my thesis work on the evolution of the Asian feedback cycle in galaxy clusters. I have given the amount of time we are only able to, able to talk about a few of these results, uh, but just to take a step back and look at the bigger picture. Uh, so. So yeah, so big picture, uh, my work focuses on galaxy evolution on the larger scales. We know that galaxies are closed boxes. Uh, over the lifetimes, they grow by merging with other galaxies, for example, and they exchange mixed material with their surroundings that we call a certain galactic medium through uh, this through inflows and outflows of material. Uh, and this is this these inflows and outflows, we call this we known as the baryon cycle. Uh, the biggest drivers of all this exchange of material at, at small ends, is, some of the biggest drivers are feedback, for example, from supernovae on the on small end. And on large scales, we have feedback from active electric nuclei, supermassive black holes. Um, so I focus on these largest galaxies and scales, which is the realm of galaxy clusters. So, uh, you know, there's a lot of galaxy cluster people here. So I'm sure you, you, a lot of you have heard galaxy cluster talk started the same way, which is to say that they're the largest objects in the universe. Uh, they contain tons of galaxies, but they're often dominated by a central brightest cluster galaxy, which we see in the uh, center or, or BCG. And so galaxy, galaxy clusters do comprise, so, comprise of so many galaxies they are incredibly massive, but most of the mass is not inside of these galaxies per se, but in the space between them, which we call the intercluster medium or the ICM. So the inner parts of this ICM can be thought of as a CGM of that central brightest cluster galaxy, BCG. Importantly, this ICM gives off X-rays via radical cooling, like for strong radiation. Uh, and the important to note about that is that the, only, the only thing I want to mention here is that this this flux from this uh, these processes are proportional to the density, inverse proportional to temperature. So when you look at an image like this on the right, um, and the X-rays that we see here, which we've thought of like Chandra, as you go towards the center of the image, it gets brighter and brighter, you're getting more flux, which is in turn telling you that you're getting a colder, denser core. Right. So by by virtue of being at the bottom, there's really deep gravitational potential. BCG should be the bluest, most star-forming galaxies in the universe. Now, that's what we would expect, perhaps. But in reality, what we see is that BCGs are these really yellow, passively evolving elliptical gases. We say that BCGs are red and dead. So this is what we call the cooling flow problem in a nutshell. Why aren't BCGs bright blue, like the bluest gases in the universe? To be a little bit more precise, if we were to measure all, take all the gas in a galaxy cluster, all this plasma, and cool it down, and, and so that we call it how much um, this maximal ICM cooling rate, we compare it to how much we actually see cooling at, shape, say, optical wavelengths, and we measure the star formation rate, the ratio of these two quantities, the star formation to the cooling rate uh, for a lot of galaxy clusters forms a distribution which peaks at around 1%. So only 1% of that cooling that could happen actually is seen forming stars. So we see that cooling suppressed by about two orders of magnitude. And the solution that the community has come up with in the past couple of decades, the consensus is that this probably uh, feedback from AGN, which is suppressing cooling by two orders of magnitude, keeping all that gas that would cool to only about 1%. That's, that is kind of the thermostat that's with a set point at about 1%. It's a kind of comfortable temperature for a galaxy cluster. Uh, so I know most of you are probably familiar with this, with this process, but for those who aren't, so the AGN feedback cycle, I'll represent in this cartoon, this really sophisticated cartoon about a galaxy cluster, the ICM represented here is with blue, and the black hole, the center represented in black, and these are definitely not the scale, but these are just, just for illustrative purposes. As ICM contracts and cools, and if certain conditions are met, which I'll talk to you about in a few minutes, if these certain thermodynamic conditions are met, you start to fuel star formation in that central galaxy as well as feeding onto the supermassive black hole at the center. Eventually, this black hole could outburst, shooting these jets of relativistic plasma out to the surroundings, coupling that accretion energy to the surroundings and heating it up, preventing it from cooling. And then eventually, these jets turn off, allowing the ice to cool again. This is a very simplified example, but this is, kind of gives you the gist of it. Uh, what that looks like in real life, is here, this multi observation of, a, of this object called sigma A. But we see in red, these are the radio jets emanating from the central black hole that we can't see in this picture, but central to the galaxy. And it, it couples um, energy to the surrounding, uh, the X-ray surroundings that, that fed it in blue. I really like pictures like this because they really emphasize how multi-wavelength observations of galaxy clusters really give us a really a, a great way to see the entire baryon cycle at, at work in the largest galaxies. And um, so we we over the over time, there's a large body of work now that, that um, showing that AGM feedback is the biggest driver of BCG evolution. It answers lots of questions like the cooling flow problem, which is a really major question. Uh, but there are still some remaining questions. Uh, in particular, for the purposes of this talk, of particular relevance is the evolution of this process. So, uh, how long, for example, has this AGM feedback cycle been in place in the largest galaxies? 
uh, how have the conditions for triggering this cooling and feedback uh, evolved over time? Has this effectiveness changed with time? So uh, we've only recently really been able to start addressing these questions with large surveys that probe out to farther and farther redshifts be able to study evolution through things like a Z surveys, for example, which I'll tell you about in a few minutes. Uh, so I really am just going to focus on the this, this second question that I've outlined. The first question I've outlined in this, in this box. If I have time, depending how fast I talk, I might have time for the, the second one. Uh, but so let's talk about the first thing. So how do you trigger cooling and feedback? So this whole cooling feedback cycle, how does it start? Well, we, st we take a look at the fuel supply, the fuel source, which is the ICF, right? This is where that all that gas comes from uh, at, at later times and when, it, when these things are relaxed. <clears throat> so looking at these in the x-rays, looking at the ICM, the thermodynamic structure that ICM tells us a lot about how, uh, whether you can expect it to be multi-phase cooling or not, fueling the star formation and, and feedback eventually. Okay. So we can measure thermodynamic properties. We can just put some simple apertures down and measure properties as a function of radius. One of these properties that we can say, we can measure is for example, entropy, which is a combination of density and temperature. And what we can say, when we look at a lot of galaxy, a sample, big samples of galaxy clusters and we measure the entropy profiles, uh, we see that when, when they're uh, when, at the centers, of, the centers of those galaxy clusters, when these galaxies have a lot of star formation going on, a lot of emission lines that tell you that star, uh, tell you that star formation is going on with like H alpha, for example, um, galaxies with H alpha detections are, are shown here in the red in red, and the ones without detections they only have upper limits are shown in black. We see that in, if you follow the black profiles as you go from out as you go inwards, uh, these black profiles kind of level off and stay and, and kind of end up at these really high values of central entropy. Whereas the galaxies that you can see emission lines, you can see this is evidence of star formation, their entropy profiles go a lot further down and they to much to much lower values of central entropy. So we can uh, just call we can just take, take some arbitrary value here. Um, and say that below this threshold value, you you see star formation of these emission lines or not, and above this threshold, you do not. So we say that the ICM becomes thermally unstable, so it's multi-phase cooling below this threshold. And it's looking at this a slightly different way, if you look at a big sample of, of, of Nazi clusters and measure whether you see H off emission or, or not, as compared uh, relative to the uh, central entropy that you measure in X-ray. So here you're measuring optical on the y-axis in the left in the left plot. You're showing um, optical. Uh, data on the uh, y-axis and extra data on x-axis. You see that below some threshold value of about 30 kV centimeter squared, that's that central entropy value. Below that threshold value, you have an explosion of detections. And to the right of this uh, threshold value, you don't have so many detections. Similarly, if you follow this field down to, to a smaller scale, you see that if you, if you look at radio wavelengths, so this is now showing you a new L new, this is a radio wavelengths compared to the extra data. And uh, you see that below the same exact threshold for the, that you had for the H-alpha detections, Below that threshold, you have an explosion of radio detections, and above that threshold, you don't have the radio detections, right? So this is telling you that when the axiom becomes thermally unstable, which is at this threshold, you measure, you trigger star formation as well as AGN feedback. So this has been demonstrated uh, a number of times now. This is a really well-established trend we see in not just entropy, but other quantities like cooling time, for example, and a few other, other ones. Uh, but importantly, I want to point out, this has only really been shown in the, in the nearby universe. So all of these sources that I'm showing you here, all the data points here are nearby systems, redshift less than 0 0.2. So what a lot of my work has been focused on uh, uh, for my thesis has been to put literally a z-axis on these two plots, uh, z-axis of redshift. So how have the conditions for triggering this cooling and feedback evolved this time? So to be able to do that, we need pretty large representative samples um, to be able to study uh, various different redshift bins, whether this threshold has evolved or not. Um, and so to, to, to do that, I've been using as part of the Southwell Telescope collaboration data from, from SBT. Um, SBT uh, discovers galaxy clusters via Sunyav's Zeldovich effect. And for those who are not familiar, this is taking the first light in the universe as CMB. As these CMB photons start to stream, stream towards us, whenever they encounter really hot plasmas, energetic plasmas such as that in a galaxy cluster, the CMB photons get scattered to higher energies. So if you look at a map of, of an SZ of the sky, uh, what you see is holes where you where you have galaxy clusters. So this allows us for redshift independent detections of galaxy clusters. So this doesn't tell you the redshift of these clusters, it just tells you that at some point between the CMB, CMB being emitted and reaching your telescope, it was absorbed, it was scattered to high energies. So we have to do follow-up observations to be able to figure out the redshift of these systems. Um, but uh, moving on, I think this is really nice because it about allows an evolution studies of, any, of a variety of different properties. So the plot I show you now is this, this is showing you the power of these SZ surveys. 
for finding galaxy clusters. So this is showing you mass versus redshift of a bunch of different galaxy clusters. And at first we have we have, for example, row set and then on the on the, the blue the blue points is blue squares in the very left of this panel, showing us flux limited surveys, giving you out to some certain redshift. But really the explosion towards the expansion towards the right of this plot, this higher redshift has been driven by a lot of these SZ surveys. So for SPT, for example, uh, I've been focused on uh, for my thesis, uh, the clustered in this red rectangle that I'm showing is XDP sample, SPT Chandra sample, or, or otherwise known as, uh, which is about 100 galaxy clusters spanning a redshift range from 0 0.3 to 1.7, which is about 10 billion years in evolution. Um, so importantly for this, for every single galaxy cluster in this red rectangle, we have X-ray data from Chandra, deep X-ray data from Chandra, radio data from ATCA, as well as optical infrared spectra from various ground-based observatories. So for each of these galaxy clusters, we have a deep extra data from Chandra. So from that, we can, we can look at the thermodynamic structure. Um, and so we can, for example, make these entropy profiles by measuring the central entropies. So for example, at 10 kiloparsecs, the central entropy, if that, how that compares to some threshold value, uh, we say that if it's below the threshold value, we should expect multi-phase cooling, for example. So we can follow this fuel down as it cools out of this multi-phase cooling cools out of the X-ray phase, goes towards optical emission. So we look at then uh, optical wavelengths to look for evidence of oxygen two emission emission lines that tell you about star formation. <clears throat> this has been one of my really big contributions to this data set, which is going down to this telescope many nights and getting optical spectra for every single one of these galaxy clusters, uh, these BCGs. So the presence of this emission lines will tell you will tell us if we expect there to be star formation or not. And finally, we can follow that cooling the fuel to the large, smaller scales and see has it made the central black hole in those BCGs. And here's just at a glance our entire sample of the radio data at the locations of each of our BCGs and it's telling and showing you just really briefly, uh, just at a glance, whether we see radio detections or not, whether we see radio source at that position or not. So um, <clears throat> connecting all of this X-ray, optical and radio data tells you, can show us the entire baryon cycle. And so this is what that looks like for our entire sample. Uh, and so we see, just I want to point out, just highlight this, that um, in the left-hand plot, we see that uh, there's a cluster, a, a locus of points in blue that we see that we are our, our detection of oxygen to, um, and there's non-detection shown in red, but these are kind of uh, kind of distinct. They have the occupy different parts of the plot. We see that they're below some threshold. They're, most of the detections lie above, below this threshold, um, and they're not so many above that threshold. There's a rather different story in the radio, radio data, um, which looks like there is there is no di distinct distinction between um, low entropy and high entropy systems as far as radio detections go. Um, I'll elaborate a bit about, about that, but just want to point out this is a really big redshift range. Maybe on the left hand plot, you know, this how, uh, how does this threshold maybe change over time? We can we can ask that question. On the right hand plot, maybe there maybe there is a, th a threshold, but it's it being blurred out because maybe it changes a lot with with the redshift and those. So just want to separate that out and see how like, more fine, finer uh, uh, separation and redshift spins uh, try to tease about part any uh, trend I'm hiding there. This is what that looks like. So uh, on the top row, I'm showing you these um, these emission line detection versus non detections as a function of entropy, and on the bottom row, I'm showing you radio detection versus non detections as a function of entropy. So just focusing on the top row for now. Uh, so this is again emission line detection versus not versus non detections. We see again at, at what's already been shown before in, in, the, in the literature. These low redshift bins. We see star formation below this threshold. And no star formation above this threshold. Now we show for the first time in these next three panels that this this persists up to very high redshifts, right? Uh, and we have this threshold that separates between the that separates detection from non detections. Um, but this has kind of been drawn from the from the uh, low redshift data. But well, let's let's see if but to see if this threshold has, has changed at all with time, but we separate them into these redshift bins and just try to measure that value by using this as a part uh, vector uh, calcifier and say and, and to show here that there is not really any significant evolution in this threshold value. And the fact that these error bars for any of these particular redshift bins don't blow up, um, we can we can still measure a consistent threshold value implies a strong long-lived connection between ICM cooling and star formation. So we see that this persists, which is really nice to see at the very high redshifts. Now we have a, a more confusing story in the radio data, which is you see in the, in in the literature, these two, two plots on the left, we have this dichotomy between detections and non-detections. Below some threshold value, we have, we have some, uh, evidence of aging activity, and above that we don't rate uh, for the most part. Uh, but when it gets to the higher redshift data, it looks like there's no dichotomy. This is, it looks like there's some strong evolution in, in these radio properties of these of these BCGs. 
Uh, and that's a bit confusing, uh, but so it's, I think it's consistent with some of these recent findings that are that are showing that the radio the, the radio mode feedback the cooling connection is not as tight in the past as it is today. Um, uh, you know, when you look at when you go towards higher redshift, the, these conditions around these systems are very different, right? There's higher merger rates as you go towards higher redshifts, for example. There's more gas availability as a result of that, more star formation. The fraction of quasar, the fraction of these agents that are in quasar mode versus radio mode are higher as you go towards higher redshift. So uh, these these can all be contributing. So for example, if you have mergers driving gas towards your your central black holes, that would show up as uh, a very high entropy core, right? But it would still be a radio detection, for example. So that could maybe explain plot or high up in the top right corners of these panels. I'm not so convinced about that explanation because I think that would probably uh, that would probably show up in these in the top rows as well because. Uh, you might have mergers driving gas or giving you more star formation in these, in these as well. So I'm not sure if that's the case. Uh, one, I think, uh, interesting uh, line of line of study, I think, would be to look at system, like these weird systems at high, high redshift we don't really see at low redshift. But for example, there's this galaxy cluster that's been discovered, Sparks 1049, redshift of 1.7, so the farthest, one of the farthest galaxy clusters we've discovered. And it also is one of the biggest starbursts in the ABCG that we've discovered. So um, this is really this is really fascinating, but that's not the, the interesting part is not that. The interesting part is that this cooling is all happening, right? You see this this peak in, X, in the blue and the X-ray emission. That cooling is happening offset from the BCG. So the BCG of the, the galaxy is, is not where that blue point is, but it's a bit offset from that. So what it's telling you is that this cooling is happening uh, in the absence of AGN feedback. There's no black hole to be able to feedback and prevent any, any more of that cooling from happening to suppress that cooling. So if this happens, let me, you might expect over time that the dynamical friction, for example, this BCG will then get aligned with this cooling flow, right? And then eventually suppress the cooling. Uh, but if this is common, if, if things, if, for example, you have offset cores more often at higher redshift, you know, bigger, more merger, bigger merger rates, um, or making things, or knocking things out of the, of the core, for example, this could happen and that would result in, you know, low, rest, low entropy cores that don't have rate detections. Um, but of course, you know, there's other 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 explanations. Maybe radio emission is not really a great uh, uh, proxy for for um, if there, you know, if if radio mode feedback is not as common uh, as it, in, the, in the past as it is today. For example, you have more quasar quasar mode systems in the, in, the, in the past. That would also kind of change things. So I think you can't really use perhaps radio mode radio luminosity as this proxy for feedback um, as as cleanly as you can in low redshift universe. Uh, this is just a really quick summary of what I've talked about so far. Um, I think, yeah, so clusters, I think, are a great way to see the entire baryon cycle and the study aging feedback. We see that these trends that we see at, at low redshifts, where, where the conditions for triggering cooling um, uh, below some certain, some certain thermodynamic thresholds are satisfied. We see this for the first time that they're satisfied even at the persist, even to our entire redshifts, um, at least in the cooling case. So cooling leads to, leads to star formation, and, and, and that's a really clean connection. Uh, but it's not so much, it's not so kind of connection between cooling and feedback as you go towards higher redshift. So I think understanding this will be uh, one of the future things that I'm going to try to explore. Um, and there, there's some more things, lots of more things we can do with this with this sample. Uh, just one thing very briefly, since I think I do have some time, uh, I won't talk about this, but uh, I've shown you this plot already. So showing you that all the cooling that you can potentially get in a, out of an of a ICM in a galaxy cluster, does not make it into star formation. Only about 1% of it does on average. So this is if you fix the float to one uh, and then you see what the normalization is. But if you relax that assumption, so let me just, um, yeah, I'll just, I'll just say this, that there's, there's, there's systems that do, do not seem to be the case that aren't really well, uh, well characterized by this average uh, cooling efficiency. So there's some systems that seem to break this thermostat of AGN feedback, where there's a lot more cooling happening, much more efficient cooling happening uh, than in most other systems. And so we, we followed those up with Hubble. We just got some more, some better data. Um, I just want to skip through this and just show you the important part, which is if you do this, the simple simple thing is just fit a line through these and not just keep a slope, slope, slope uh, constant. What we see is this uh, a steep within unity relation between star formation and cooling rate. So what this is telling you is that you're getting a gradual increase in the efficiency of cooling which in turn could also be a gradual decrease in the effectiveness of feedback on the other hand, right? So there's different explanations, like I have arguments we can make for this, which I'm happy to talk about if anybody's interested. But uh, really uh, interestingly, uh, curious, curiously, the thing as you go towards these higher cooling rates, you also these systems are also higher redshift systems. So 
Uh, is that a coincidence? Is that a, a relative dependence to this effectiveness of the event? I think in the sample that we studied, this is from a paper from a year and a half ago now, um, I think it's not the right sample to study this. This is kind of more biased sample. These are more extreme systems. But we do have a sample I've been telling you about, this SPT sample, to be able to address this. And I, this is very preliminary now, but uh, what I'm showing you now is just something I've made in the last a month or two. Um, Showing us that even at higher redshift, you still have this deeper than unity relation between cooling rate and star formation rate. And there seems to be no real significant evolution in the average efficiency of the event. Um, and I also want to study this with the upcoming SPT3G survey that has thousands of clusters, which will be able to study um, study large, large samples of this. And I want to be able to use machine learning to characterize this. And so uh, I don't know if everybody knows about it. I'll be coming back coming to the CFA in the fall. And I hope to be doing this kind of work here. So I'm excited to work on this kind of stuff in the future. Uh, I will uh, just leave that summary now and just uh, take other questions. Mm -hmm. Thank you so much. Do we have any questions from Kuhn? So uh, you have considered the AGM feedback by radio data, right? Is that an extended radio emission? Can you measure agent activity, agent strength, roughly, either by X-ray data or the line diagnosis, any, anything like that? Right. So, yeah, two, two, two points to that question. So, uh, I think most of our data aren't high resolution enough to be able to see you know, different parts of the components the rate emission. So, it's really just detection and versus non-detection. Um, uh, we do have multiple bands, for example, this ACA data, we, I've, I've been showing you just like one band. I showed you in this, this snapshot where I have all of the radio data there. Um, but we have multiple bands and uh, so, you see this? Yeah. So this is like two gigahertz data. We have two, five, nine gigahertz. And we also have these ASCAP data that I, I use for these for this analysis as well when I didn't have ACA data. And that has many other frequency bands available as well. So in the future, I would like to do a kind of a decomposition, radio SED decomposition, and be able to say what is part of the active, you know, accreting parts of this radio emission versus, you know, older populations of electrons. Uh, so that's what's one part. I want to be able to, I want to do that, this, this decomposition. Um, and then other studies, uh, so there's this paper by like Julie Havacek Rondo, um, who studied cavities in these, in the SBT systems. So, uh, it's a, uh, it's like a redshift of like 0.8, uh, 0 0.8 I think is the upper limit. Uh, here I'm considering like redshift of 1.7 up to 1.7 clusters. And these you can't really try. It's the data aren't good enough uh, to be able to find cavities. Um, we need you know more uh, better re special resolution and uh, more sensitive telescopes um, in, the, in the future. Um, like access from my, my, for example would be good for that. But I think we've kind of exhausted the part the uh, parts the, the the systems we can study with Chandra. Um, to be able to find cavities at higher redshifts. So that, that has been done, and we, we've found that there's no really significant evolution in the, for example, cavity power um, versus, you know, cooling luminosity uh, up to redshifts like 0 0.8, but I think we can't really go much further than that. Any more questions? Can you see any questions on one? No, no question. Okay, so let's thank Michael again. Thank you. And hopefully, very nice talk. And you're still should be a good transition yeah. to the second speaker <clears throat> while Wayne launches the presentation. Let me introduce. So, our second speaker is uh, Wayne Van Gartner. Why do we switch this? Um, he's been astrophysicist at the NASA Mass Space Center since 2016. Wayne is made as a printer. Share different windows. And now it's sharing the whole screen. Got it. Yes, sir. Uh, Thank uh, you. Yeah. Yeah. Wade's first work in this area was on the CZT hard X ray detectors on the Hippocus balloon mission, and then at Caltech on the CZT detectors for the head balloon mission and the new star explorer mission as well. Uh, Wade has written several papers on the Swift Bat hard X ray survey and then also a recorder uh, on the detectors for the GEMS X ray polarimetry mission, NASA mission, and Fox and Felix mission. Which I think is going to be the main focus of the presentation of today. He's coming to Marshall. Uh, we served as a calibration scientist for LHP X ray for mission, the recent awarded one. Marshall served as a leader for the US Athena optics uh, calibration, and also is distributor of the eye for the Foxy optics. 
um, also those maps and with access product proposals. It also le leads the NOSERI SRE telescope on the GAMO mid proposal. Okay. And uh, with that, uh, we the floor is yours. Thanks for coming. Thank you very much. Um, yes, today I'd like to talk to you about X ray optics that we've been developing at Marshall Space Flight Center. Um, we have a rather large group at Marshall. You can see them here. Scientists are on the top row. We have mostly engineers on the second row, and uh, we have the head of the XRCF there on the right. So we're supporting a lot of people with our directed work package from NASA, and we've been having some success lately, which I'd like to tell you about. So first to start with a little motivation, why are we looking to improve the resolution of full shell replicated optics? We have Chandra, but uh, Chandra's status is a little bit uncertain, unfortunately, these times. But um, what is driving this sort of goal? Well, the obvious one is for future flagship mission links. It would be great to have subpar second resolution and a, and a platform that's not quite as heavy as China. Uh, but there are also medium sized missions that are continuing to need optics. The Pierce mission, the Japanese mission there, uh, reflight at the hard X ray side of the Tomi. 10 R seconds is their requirement. Um, uh, Force the Jedi is that Japanese mission. Fierce is a solar mission. Uh, boxy in space, and I'll talk about that more later. That's 10 R second requirement. And even X ray probes, some of which are done here, have around 15 R second requirement for the hard X ray XB. And LEM, uh, which has a strong presence here, has about a 10 R second requirement. So low mass optics are still needed with high angular resolution. So, where have we been in the past? Well, you can see in the upper right there, that is kind of a synopsis of the history of angular resolution of full shell replicate optics. XP, recently done by Marshall, 19 arc seconds. XMM, which you're familiar with, uh, about 20 years ago, 17 arc seconds. Swift XRT, 18 arc seconds, HPD. And Evo Zeta, 15 arc seconds, HPD. So that's kind of the state of the art is around 15 arc seconds. So we're hoping to uh, do better than that. So uh, one argument for, for lightweight optics is uh, what, that can be characterized by looking at the aerial density. So Chandra is an exquisite optic, but is rather heavy. And you can see that the mass for collecting area is around three kilograms per square centimeter. XMM did much better than that. Full shell replicate optics again, half a kilogram per square centimeter. Foxy 3, which I'll be talking about here, uh, does even better at 0.3 kilograms per square centimeter. Uh, the silicon made a shell technology, which you've heard about from Goddard. Uh, their goal is 120, 120th of the Chandra value, so that's about 0.2. And the XP mission, the office we built for that and recently, uh, that achieved 0.16 kilograms per square centimeter. So we already have fairly light optics right now. Um, and we hope that we can build bigger optics than XP and higher angular resolution. Okay, here are some flight projects that we've been doing at Marshall through the years. On the left, we have the HERO balloon mission from around 2000, hard X ray telescopes. There's the FOXY-3 second from the left on the bottom. Um, that is the sounding rocket mission, seven co-aligned telescopes I'll be talking about. The third one along the bottom is RDXC. That's the hard rate X-ray telescope on spectrum lump and gamma. So that's flying along with the Zeta. And our most recent optics project has been XB. And you can see that picture on the right, uh, 24 nested shells and then a soft X-ray band, two to, two to eight kV. So I don't need to tell this group about Walter Optics, so I will skip that. Uh, but just to say that we're talking about Walter Optics here from Marshall. But it is useful to talk about the process. How do you make these things? It's a several-step process. It starts from the mandrel, and the shell is uh, essentially electroplated on the mandrel. So the process, you make a mandrel, you coat it with electrolytic nickel that provides a hard surface that you can machine and polish. Um, then you diamond turn to get exactly your parabolic and hyperbolic uh, profile. And then you polish, step four. That's where a lot of the secret sauce is. And you're doing metrology. And then on the bottom, you're making inner shells. It's electroplating, essentially. And since we're electroplating thick shells, that can be called electroformed. Uh, and then the shell is separated from the mandrel, step eight. In a water bath, you use differential contraction of different CTEs of aluminum and a nickel shell. And the nickel shell will just pop right off and leave any of the shells there on the right. So I want to talk to you a lot today about the FOXY sounding rocket mission. This is a heliophysics mission. It's a hard X-ray telescope. 
Foxy is kind of a program that's intended to be new stock for the sun, eventually on a satellite program. But they've had three successful family rocket flights, and the fourth family rocket flight is scheduled to happen this next week where the flight window opens up and opens up last day. And our group has built optics for Foxy 4, where we've been trying to push uh, the angular resolution. So this is an example of an observation. Uh, the left two panels are uh, contemporaneous observations between RESI and the Foxy Sony rocket. This is data from Foxy 1. And you can see the nice advantage that real focusing optics have over rotation microbes and collimator instrument. And on the right is kind of a movie of the observations during the six minute rocket flight of Foxy 2. So again, these are some more photographs of optics we've made at Marshall. These are optics we've made for the FOXY4 mission, the most recent ones, the ones that are going to fly in about a week. You can see in the lower left are the completed flight modules that we've made uh, that have been delivered or integrated in the payload. And they are undergoing some testing. And in the middle, they're going undergoing calibration under beamline. So what sort of angular resolution can we expect? Well, this is the previous best that we've measured with FOXY. This is Foxy 3, which was launched a couple of years ago, flew successfully. Um, and the PSF that we get with that set of optics is five R seconds, full with half mass. And so when people are, are kind of traditionally thinking full with half mass among my gastrophysicists who usually think of HPD. So these optics have 20 R seconds HPD. This is Foxy 3. This is before we started Foxy 4. So what are some of the limitations on the optics angular resolution? Well, these are mostly uh, process limitations. So we have the shell axial figure, and this has to do with the polishing and shaping of the mandrels. We have the circularity. Um, when the shell comes off the mandrel, does it maintain this perfectly circular shape? That uh, could be altered because of the replication and separation process. We have alignment. Co-nesting several shells into one spider to make a module. Those have to be aligned to micron precision. And the replication and separation issues, everything associated with electroforming. This is the most difficult part right now of making these optics. We have stress during the coating, the electroforming. We have perhaps uneven electric fields in the back. The separation from the mandrel is a stochastic process. It's a little bit of magic going on there that's not fully known. And then we, of course, we have shell circularity error which results from the separation, so from any issues in separation. So for FOXY4, we attempted to tackle these problems with a, kind of a three-pronged research program. Number one is polishing. Um, we went from a traditional um, kind of uh, old-fashioned lap polishing technique to a deterministic CNC machine. The second prong was replication and separation, seeing if we could get a handle on what's going on there. And the third prong was the assembly. If we can improve the assembly to make sure the shells are co-nested and eliminate as many of the errors from that as we could. So here's a video. Let's see if I can show. This shows a traditional lap polishing of a um, Marshall mandrel. That's an ICSI mandrel. It's a large M22. And you can see the gray slurry. You can see the lap going back and forth. And you can see those stripes left in the slurry. Those are from the cut marks that are made in the lap to make sure there's a lot of um, a lot of surfaces where the cutting happens between the lap and the mandrel. So this process is something that Isaac Newton would have been familiar with, more or less. And you can be issues. You can imagine that the lap um, translation speed can have a beat frequency with the rotation uh, of the module. So that could lead to errors um, in the actual polishing. The polishing will become uneven unless those parameters are set very carefully. And that's some of the problems we've had with this technique. The metrology of these mandrels, it's an iterative process. You polish a little bit, then you'll measure a little bit, and then you'll figure out where you need to polish and keep going. So this is done with a Zygo interferometer. There's a 12 inch, a 14 inch interferometer. There's a mandrel being tested uh, with the interferometer. And so we can get um, uh, precisions of, on, on, of a few nanometers. So these are the sort of errors we see after the lap polishing. These are some um, error profiles from an experiment we did to test uh, a separation of various shells. And you can see that the peak to valley errors are on the order of a few hundred nanometers. So this is all of those features at a wavelength of a few centimeters. Uh, those result from the lap polishing. 
So this is the Zico polishing machine, deterministic. Um, and I'll show you a video of it in operation. So you can see it has a rotating bonnet there that's made of a pliable material. You can think of it as a tennis ball cut in half. You can see the slurry going onto it and it moves up and down. And then between strokes, it rotates slightly uh, to cover the whole mandrel. So this is deterministic. The length of time, the dwell time of the head on a particular part of the mandrel is altered because of the metrology. We can tell it to spend more time on the high spots. And therefore, it's a lot more deterministic than the lap polishing where you have no control over that. So this is one of the big things we wanted to do to go to higher angular resolution to try and beat down the axial errors. And we were mostly successful. Okay. So this is an example of what we are able to do with the Zico polisher. On the left is um, the profile from the lap polishing. So that's what it looked like after FOXY3. We had five arc second HPD errors, and those were the profile errors. After one round of the Zico polishing, we drove that down to 2.3 arc seconds HPD to the blue curve. And after the third round, that took us down to one arc second HPD. This is on the mandrels themselves. And in fact, we got just slightly better than that. We got down to 0.9 arc seconds HPD was our final result. Um, and you can see right away. So these are some images taken from the beam line from calibration. And you can see qualitatively the difference between uh, lap polishing over here and Zico polishing over here. So the lap polishing has a much broader ring. This is an image taken out of focus by about four centimeters. So you can see the ring before it focuses to a point. And on here, you can see that that ring image is uh, much sharper as a result of polishing. And this on the right is the um, out of focus ring image of a module. This is an engineering unit we constructed. The inter shell there is a Zico polish shell, and the outer one is a lap polish shell. So you can kind of see the distinction um, caused by the polishing ring. So this is, shows our last level of Zico polishing. Um, so this is the curve, this is the profile down the cylindrical mandrel taken at 64 different angles. So several different profiles along the mandrel to try and characterize the entire mandrel. And our last step of polishing is we investigated using a different polishing profile for each different algorithm. So not only were we polishing the mandrel differently along its whole diameter, but at every single azimuth, we can customize it uh, to to improve the figure. And so with this polishing, we were able to go from about 1.2 arc seconds, or excuse me, 1.8 down to about 0 0.9 arc seconds. And this is how we've achieved a sub arc second figure on our mattress. So replication, I'll show you. This is a video of a mandrel coming out of the electroforming bath. Um, this was the second prong of our research program. And uh, this is an area we were not able to make quite as much progress as with the um, polishing front. Replication is kind of a little bit magic garden. There's a lot of parameters that need to be optimized. So we tried to model the electric field when using some console software to make sure it was uniform in the bath. We had deposition on the mandrel uniform to make sure it had an even thickness. And we made some improvements there. Um, we experimented with different gasket designs on the end of the mandrel that delineate the shell edges. And we found that the uh, tasks we did did not have any improvement. So we still have some work to do in this area. And so that leaves um, the third area of our research program, and that's the assembly station. There's a lot of technical progress that goes into this assembly station. And there's a lot of detail here. Um, just to say, we started with the Ixby assembly station. This is the device used for putting a shell on the spider and aligning all those shells to come in the same direction. Uh, and these are some of the improvements we made for Ixby. And for Foxy, we did all the improvements here in the second column. So we added a rotary stage at the top so we could rotate that shell while we're hanging it before we move it. Um, we stiffened the structure. We've added some stabilizers here down at the bottom. Uh, we've improved the kinematics of the mouse. And we've improved the bearing. We added this granite base. And so this bearing went from our minute type errors down to our second type errors as we spin the metrology around the natural pressure. So, and one of the last things we did was a kind of a new invention. This is work that Steve Bongiorno did in our group. And um, this is what we call pico bushy. 
So I'll come back to the spot on the right after I showed you that figure. So here's an example of the shell on the spider being glued in the top right. You see the Ixby technique. You can see that comb there with slots in it. The shells are glued in. And here you see the Foxy technique, which is different. And the important difference is right here. Here there is a clip which holds the shell, and then the clip also attaches to the spider. And what that does is changes the direction of epoxy shrinkage. In this technique up at the top, the epoxy shrinkage causes the shell to go in and out. In this technique, the clips are glued to the shell first, and then the clips are glued to the spider. So the epoxy shrinkage at the last critical stage is as a mucil rather than as seal. And so this means that the epoxy shrinkage will distort the shell less, leading to a better figure. So we found by the via experimentation through Foxy that this technique works better for mounting shells than the XP technique. Can you remove the shells, the clips? Nope, that's the structural element which is used to join the shells to the spider. So that's the in place. So I mentioned in Pico pushing. One other thing that we can do, um, the way this, this station works is it has, right there is a chaos sensor. It's a proximity sensor. It measures its distance from the sensor to the shell surface. So the shell is hanging from wires, very delicately balanced and offloaded. It has its natural shape. And then these sensors are rotated around the mandrel. So you can get a distance and therefore you can figure out the shape of the mandrel, uh, its ellipticity, whether it's tilted, whether the whole thing is offset. And once you have that information, you can move the shell around, tilt it, and adjust it to exactly where you need it to go before you put the glue in and finalize the location. So. Since we have this mythology system, what we decided to do, up above you can see a shell before and after the clips were installed. We did a measurement here that we don't usually do. We measured the shell with the clips on it, and we saw that there's a little bit more ellipticity in it on the right. Some part of the process induced that. So we thought, well, let's see if we can hang it here, push on it with these Pico motors there, see if we can reduce the ellipticity to make it circular and have a better shape. So that's a new experiment that we did. And it proved to be rather successful. I'll go back to that other chart I was talking about. On the right, the thing to look at are the blue and the yellow curves. Um, the light curves are before the pico pushing, and the dark curves are after the pico pushing. And this is plotting the delta delta r, which is related to the angle between the p and the h sections as you go around an azimuth. So you can see that the peak to valley of the DDR error went down from by a factor of uh, two to three. And this leads to more circular shells and reduce the error we were getting in their performance uh, due to out of circularity. So one thing to note about this whole assembly process is, um, and one thing that I learned as a result of this process, I thought that the assembly, co-aligning 10 or 24 or 28 shells would be the dominant error in the performance of these optics. But it turns out that's not the case. With an assembly station like this, you can keep the circularity errors and the uh, the centration errors, how the shells are not go aligned, that contribution to HPE is about an arc second. So that's not a limiting factor for these topics. Uh, the assembly station works very well. Okay, here are some more things uh, about the limitations of the optics and the performance. The foxy shells that you've seen are relatively long and skinny. Their aspect ratio is, is close to 10. So that means that when um, the shells are held on the end, they droop because of gravity. And you can see that this is the shape that the shells have when they're drooping because of gravity. That is one effect that we see with Foxy that we don't see with other telescopes like XP because those shells are shorter and wider, and so they resist gravity as much. They don't have as much of a moment of inertia that they can torque around. So this is something we had to consider for Foxy when we were doing testing. And the other thing that we have is these mandrels for Foxy were made over 10 years ago for Foxy 1. Our process has improved since then. So these mandrels have a slight banana shape to them on the order of a couple of microns, and that causes shells to be bent with a bow, and that shape is somewhat similar to the gravity shape. So these are some of the errors that we have in performance. You can see the simulation on the left, you get coma when you have gravity uh, on these shells. And on the right is an actual measurement from the beam line which uh, really closely matches the expected coma shape. The interesting thing is you would take a shell in the beam line and you could clock it four or five different angles to investigate whether the curve caused by the bow would rotate as you use the shell and how that affected the performance. Here's the performance, the HPD, 
as a function of rotation angle. And you can see sinusoidal variation there because sometimes the bow is aligned with the gravity vector and sometimes it's not. All right. So error budget. This is kind of where uh, it really comes down to the line. So we've done a calculation. Steve Bongiorno has helped with this for the error budget for a proposed optic we have for a balloon mission. So you can see all the contributors to the performance. The dominant contributor is the replication error. That comes in at about seven or seconds for this optical design. The other con contributions are much smaller. The polishing, that's a two R second right there. That's not very large. The bow, 2.5 R seconds. That's improved with better mandrel manufacturing techniques. So that's, we're not too worried about um, one of the other large ones. Epoxy shrinkage at the one R second level. And we have, so, so this is all pointing system. This is going to be particular to your platform. Uh, this is the balloon system. And the other one is the temperature. Which one is that? Right here. The azimuth low temperature gradient. So it turns out that a, a deformation of these shells, the one that one, you're most concerned with is a temperature change across the diameter. If one half of the shell is different temperature than the other, that will distort the shell because of thermal expansion, such that you get an error in the performance. And you're somewhat sensitive to that. It's about a three arc second error in the HPD for a one degree C change in the diameter. So in practice, you don't usually see temperature changes that large across the diameter. The entire optic is, is held together very well thermally, and so it tends to cover the same temperature. But that's something that we're sensitive about. And to really achieve high resolution at the arc or sub arc second level, it's going to require careful temperature regulation. So um, let's see. Just, we're almost done here. These are ideas for improving the shell separation I can talk about if you'd like. And here in the last couple of slides are the results we've achieved with FOXY3. These are the three flight modules we have. Um, and we measured in, in our beam line. And these are the results from the beam line. We're at about the nine mark second level, which we're very happy to see. You can see the, the image of the PSF. And you can see there's kind of a flattening here so you can see the gravity shape right into the PSF directly. So you the coma going up to the left and to the right. Um, so these are the results from our flight optics that we delivered to the FOXY team. And here's uh, my last slide. So we've been happy with the Zico polishing. We've shown that that's successful. You can take your bigger errors on your mandrel down to the arc second and sub arc second level. But the thing I didn't mention is that it's extremely resource intensive. These two mandrels were polished for about 14 months just to get the Zico machine to take the error down. And this was a trial run and our duty cycle was rather low because it was an R&D effort. Um, and we can do a lot better now, but it's still very resource intensive. For a flight project, you need several Zico machines and a million dollars to pop. It would take some careful planning to do a flight mission at this level of performance. The assembly station we've been very happy with. Uh, we're still fine tuning that, but uh, we think that's not the dominant contributor to the error. The replication work is where we need to do more uh, more study. We have several ideas that we're gonna look into over the next couple of years, but that's that's where we need to focus right now if we want to improve the outlets even more. Um, yeah, so as I said, our optics we, that we measure in the beam line are about the nine or second level. And when you subtract out the gravity contribution, the gravity and the mandrel bowl, we predict that in flight, um, these will have a five to R second HVD resolution. So thank you very much. Thank you. So do we have any questions here? Uh, maybe I'll ask uh, what is the energy at which the PSF is measured? Yeah, so these PSF measurements are taken usually with at copper K alpha, so we're talking about 8K. More questions? Uh, let me see. With the five to seven RC to HPD, what was your uh, mandrel? That was used for that transportation. So both of these mandrels, so um, they're both down at the 1.3 R second level. That's just mandrel bigger errors. 
And only one of the mandrels, uh, we had time to do the final zero polishing step that took it down to 0 0.9 seconds. So one mandrel is 0 0.9 seconds, the other is about 1.3, and the whole system together, the two shells rounded in the module are at this, this last, the seven arc second level. And the major contributor to that is the replication error in shells, and that's around five arc seconds. So. Can you remind us again of what the X speed parameters would be compared to what is here? Um, I'm not the person to give the, the exact answers to that question. I think um, I, my understanding is the requirements current ones are around 15 or seconds. So, of course, they would like to have better, but I think the requirements uh, perhaps adjusted a little bit to the state of the art at the time. I think they're for some of their optics, they're going with rare optics, which are about that level. And I think, um, I don't know, what, I don't know who they're going with. I didn't read their final proposal. They might have those items as well. And one other quick question you mentioned at the beginning of the talk again, a balloon program. Yeah, this is a program that we put in as an APRA this past year, so it's January. So this is called Superhero, it's kind of an extension of the. The hero that Brian Ramsey had, the heroes, and now there's the 12 meter balloon version called Superhero. Yeah, sounds interesting. <clears throat> Thank you. Any other questions before the presentation? Okay. Uh, last time on some CME. Okay, so let's thank both speakers today. <laughs> So we are looking for uh, volunteers for the organization of the uh, seminar for next semester. So uh, if you are young, 